I don't have any fancy notes or anything, so. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to keep that in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, welcome to the return of CFG. Uh, glad we're all back together again. Uh, it's been a while since we've actually recorded. I, th- I don't think it's been that long since there's been an episode up, but yeah, we're back. Uh, just quickly though, some business. Uh, the Aussie Canuck podcast is on a temporary hiatus, uh, just because of my fault and 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 my well, fault. Mainly my. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it will be back. It's not. It's not. It's not gone for good. It, it'll be back. Um, especially seeing as there's a big versus movie coming coming out pretty soon uh, in Australia. The Houses versus Fat Pizza movie. So. Probably gonna have to do a whole episode on that some, at some stage, so mm-hmm. it will. <laughs> well, so we'll be back in soon. soon. Um, but uh, I just so we're not keeping you hanging here. we we've got myself, the magnificent magpie, and the ever enthusiastic superhero enthusiast. Hey, everybody! And the man with. Uh, <laughs> I don't get a fancy intro. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say something about ha- having your back. So the man that's always got your back, Steve Baxi. Beware. Man, the man who's always got your back. See? <laughs> the man who's got your back. See, that's perfect. <laughs> so uh, what we're talking about today is <laughs> cliffhangers. Uh, how... Uh, Specifically, so some ones we do like. Uh, probably we're going to mention some ones we don't like. Uh, one thing I really want to focus on is uh, what makes a good one, what makes a bad one, and some examples of those. Uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, my favorite cliffhanger because it has a great, not only a great. Uh, it it ends on a great note uh, uh, and makes you really want to see that next episode. Uh, and uh, probably uh, probably at the time when it aired, probably had a lot of the audience saying that as well. Uh, and it had a good follow-up. Uh, so that's the season one uh, episode finale of The West Wing. Uh, because... I love that show. I think it's one of the best TV shows that's ever been on television. And it's a pre- it starts out pretty mundane episode, pretty ordinary, and then it gets to the end, and there's a bunch of shooting, and we get glimpses of all our characters, and then it ends with a with a voiceover saying. Who's been hit? Who's been hit? And then face to black. And, of course, the follow-up is great, but I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen any of that yet. So that's uh, my favorite cliffhanger because you literally, like, anything could have happened. And to me, that's what makes a good cliffhanger is you don't know you you don't know what's happened and any of your characters could be in jeopardy especially especially in a, uh, the end of the first season i think is cuz you, you don't know who's decided to stick around who they've decided to fire who's the... <laughs> <laughs> so uh i think that's what makes a good one uh your guys thoughts um well, I guess just to contrast yours a little bit, um, I'll talk about one of my favorite cliffhangers, um, which is Breaking Bad Season 5, Episode 13. Um, the one right before Ozymandias, but they all get into the desert. Uh, Hank's following them, and um, the Nazi red skins just show up, and Walt's trying to defuse the situation. And essentially the episode ends with Walt kind of panicking, um... Hank and his partner are ready to shoot, and the Nazis showing up with their machine guns and such, and it fades to black as bullets fa- as bullets fire. Um, and it, it's got to be one of the most intense moments in television history, I think. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know anyone who didn't see that episode and wonder what's going to happen next, or not, or not care about the next or the follow-up episode. Um, I, there, there's a reason Ozymandias is everyone's favorite episode of that show, usually. And that's because the lead-up to it was so good. Um, 
And you mentioned something that we wanted to talk about, which is how much the follow-up to a cliffhanger matters. And I think it's pretty important, or the cliffhanger in general just seems a gimmicky to me. Um, and that's why I wanted to talk about this episode particularly, because it feels like it's just two episodes split, or it feels like one episode split into two, rather than just a way to hold your audience over for a week. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Because the, the one example that I would point to being a big Trekkie is Best of Both Worlds and Star Trek Next Generation. And it was, uh, they did this thing in TNG, and I guess it really started with uh, Best of Both Worlds, and that was they would end a season on a cliffhanger, and then you would have to wait a really, really long time to see part two of that. Um, And in that case, it really was not a case of two parts of a full episode. They didn't have the second part written when they filmed the first part because they didn't know whether or not Patrick Stewart was going to come back because um, mm, his contract was up. Yeah, so there's, again, it kind of feeds into what Magpie was saying about behind-the-scenes considerations. Um, but certainly I have issues with the the payoff to that in part two, and uh, that could maybe be a whole discussion in itself. But um, oh, yeah. I, I think part one is still hands down, you know, one of the tensest things I've ever seen. Um, and everything that in that episode builds up towards that moment um, when Riker has to make the decision to fire or not, and he chooses to fire, um, which shows that he's earned the big chair, which is what the episode is really about. Um, and then I just kind of find the payoff to everything a little bit lackluster because, you know, yeah. Picard gets rescued from the Borg and they kind of hit the magic reset button and uh, everything's okay again, which is sort of mm-hmm. unfortunate. I'm glad you mentioned that, because I really don't like Best of Both Worlds, even though I'm not a big Trekkie, but I don't even like Part 1 very much, simply because the second part feels so lazy to me. Oh, yeah. And I've I've kind of come to the conclusion that I think they should have killed off Picard. Um, now, I say that with full knowledge of they didn't, and all of his best episodes were after that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's kind of like, ugh, to put in a tough situation there. We wouldn't have gotten, you know, stuff like Inner Light and Tapestry um, mm. if he had been killed off. But it felt, really having gone back and rewatched the first couple seasons of that show lately, it really did feel like everything in that show was building towards Riker finally becoming the captain. And then to not do that just seems like a fake out. Mm. So payoff is important, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm. I got a question for you after we finish recording, Alex, about about <laughs> that episode. Um, because... Uh, I was thinking about it uh, just before we started recording it. Uh, it was really, like, I had this idea pop in my head uh, that might have actually salvaged the part two of that if they had uh, paid it off later down the line. But well, I guess the other uh, thing to mention too, with regards to the first part of Best of Both Worlds, is they really do trick you and set it up as if like Picard is going to get killed off. They bring in this new character who is sort of set up to be the new first officer. They do all these things to to put you in a position where you're like, wow, the the stakes here are enormous because I mean they they it's about the Borg who had all, we'd only seen really one time before and we had seen their effects before and the way that episode even just begins is this uh it really really terse for a Star Trek teaser. Um yeah. Uh, it's like they just beam down to a planet and, like, everything is gone. There's a whole city that's just been scooped up out of the Earth. Um, they just mm-hmm. hit you with everything. And so yeah. there's a whole lot of tension. And then, you know, again, part two just kind of cuts it. Yeah. 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 So we've all mentioned uh, at least some good ones. And we kind of touched on a, a bad follow-up to a, a good cliffhanger. What... Are uh, some real? I'm gonna mention one from my favorite sh- uh, favorite show again. Uh, well, one of my favorite shows, it's The West Wing. Is I think it was season three or four because uh, uh, they they went on hiatus just before 9/11 happened, and while the episode two happened at on 9/11, they we're heading into a season where they were going, where the pre, uh, the president on that show was going to be running for re-election, and it was pretty obvious that they were going to run again, and 
uh, it was not very, there was not much tension there, really. But they did try, at least they did try and give some tension to whether or not he was going to run again. But it was like, who else are they going to put in that spot? And uh, they pretty much gave away the ending to it. So I think that one was a pretty crappy um, cliffhanger because we all know Martin Sheen's not leaving the show. So why would they... I don't know why they would do that. It's, it's, it seems so silly. So uh, that's one. Of, I think that's a really bad one. Is because like, if you know that no, that nothing's gonna come of it, there's not much, t- and there's not much tension there. Why why even bother having it? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, which sort of allows me to bring up one of my favorite cliffhangers, um, which is. The one from the original Italian job, where literally oh. at the end of the movie, they are in a bus hanging over a cliff. <laughs> um, and uh, the whole plot of the movie is they're trying to steal a gold bullion. And they succeed in doing that, and they're in the Alps, and uh, the bus, I guess, I can't even remember what happens, but there's some sort of accident or something, and they end up kind of in this precarious situation where all of the gold is on one end of the bus and they're all standing at the other end of the bus and the bus is like a teeter-totter on the cliff. And a sequel was never made to that movie, so we don't know how it was resolved. And there are movies that do deliberately end that way um, and ones that don't even have a planned sequel. So what do you guys think about those types of cliffhangers? Um, Not just like literal cliffhanger, but just ones where... There isn't supposed to be a follow-up. Uh, um, well, I guess I can touch on that a little bit because one of my my favorite show of all time is Angel, and that show got canceled when there was only a few episodes left of season five. And season five, the very last episode, not fade away, uh, is essentially a cliffhanger. There's no ending. Basically, what happens is Angel and his team are cornered in an alley. And there's just a bunch of demons and monsters and dragons about to hit them. And the last line is something like Angel wants to slay the dragon and they go to work. Um, and there's mm-hmm. no follow up. Uh, there's the comics, but which came much later, but it wasn't planned. Uh, so mm-hmm. essentially, a lot of people saw that episode and complained because they're like, they don't know what happens to Angel. They don't know what happens to the whole um, prophecy of that show. They don't know what ha- what really was supposed to become of the characters that died in that episode. Um, but the reason I love that episode so much is because the cliffhanger is the epitome of what the show is about in the first place, where the show is about good versus evil, and that's something that's not going to end, and it's about characters that are on a a continuous path. So to give them a definitive ending would undercut what their journey is about in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think if if you can make a case that your whole premise is built around something that has to keep going... If it's an idea that's constant, like if it's a Batman story or an Angel story or whatever, then it's okay to end on a cliffhanger. Um, My only problem when you have a single piece of work that isn't supposed to be followed up is, does the cliffhanger um, feed too much into the plot, or does it feed into your interpretation of the piece as a whole? Because if it's something like um, Thor The Dark World, where it's feeding into the plot, and that's why it bugs me, um, then it doesn't work very well. But if it's something like Inception, maybe, where there's a cliffhanger, but it's not about what what the story is saying. It's about what you can read about the film through the cliffhanger. See, I wouldn't necessarily even characterize Inception as a movie that has a cliffhanger ending. Um, yeah, any of the things think it's kind of a red herring, but yeah, certain exactly some some things in the movie are not resolved, and that's deliberate. But the story itself is resolved. I guess yeah, we don't yeah. get answers um, to specific questions that are brought up by the movie, but yeah. Uh, and most people always debate like whether or not it was a dream based on the way the the top fell, but that's not really the point of watching it. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. But yeah, like that's what I mean. Like if if you can if the cliffhanger is there, if there's an ending that's ambiguous on purpose in order to help you understand the piece as a whole, then it works a lot better than if it's just mm-hmm. there to kind of screw your head about the plot not making sense. So what specifically with regards to Thor the Dark World do you have a problem with in, in terms of it feeding into the plot? Um, okay, yeah, I don't think I've ever talked about this on on mic before. Um, my issue with Thor the Dark World 
uh, there are numerous because there's a bunch of plot issues in that movie anyway. But it, mm. it, if anyone hasn't seen it, um, it essentially ends with Loki disguising himself as Odin. And that's the final shot we see, um, at least before the post credit scenes. And my whole issue with that is the movie is about Loki and Thor. And Loki's illusions are a big part of his character in the movie. So they they purposely write a scene where Thor is able to see through Loki's illusions. And it's kind of a payoff from the Avengers where Loki's like, are you ever not going to fall for that? And then he proceeds to fall for it again just so we can have a really fancy ending that screws with our expectations. And it doesn't make any sense that Loki would be able to do that, nor does it make sense that he's able to beat Odin and get there. And it leaves too many questions just for the sake of leaving questions, and it doesn't resolve Loki's character arc. It's one thing to, like, make movies that you can uh, branch off and do more stories with. It's another to make a two-part movie and pitch it as one. Mm-hmm. And that's what really bugs me about movies, because we're not going to get a sequel for like three years until that, after that movie comes out, and that's a problem. So what about those movies then, um, like some of the later Harry Potter ones, I guess, where they split them into two movies? Um, how do you guys feel about those? Well, there's only one I've seen. I, did, I haven't seen the last few a few Harry Potter, so I, I'm not going to voice my opinion on that, but if we get the uh, pirates of the Caribbean at World's End and uh, whatever the other one was, uh, that that sort of treatment, uh, pirates one and two, that's a problem because it's clear from at least in the pirates world, which uh, that this. They had an idea for it to split the, the the movie in two, but they didn't have enough money, uh, have enough story for the for the second part, <laughs> the, the the trilogy. It's so it, it's everything's front loaded in that one to get us to a certain point, and then it's like, what? There's hardly anything going on in the in the. Uh, second part uh, of the, that it's just like uh... so I guess what you're saying is knowing where to cut it is a really important thing yeah have both stories written and make sure you got enough for for a second part rather Cause, than yeah because essentially they split movies just to make more money off of them anyway um, mm-hmm. and Harry Potter the last book I don't like at all I think the last book is really terrible um, so I was disappointed when they cut that movie into two, but it's actually right. the opposite case of what you were talking about, Magpie with Pirates, where it, um, instead of being front loaded, it's end loaded, where the first movie uh, does nothing at all. Part one is completely superfluous, and then part two has everything that matters. And I, I'm almost sure they did that not because they wanted to adapt the book mm. successfully, which they kind of did, being that it, it does nothing happens for half of it. Um, but they, they mostly did it just so they could war they could warrant like releasing two movies within two years and make more money off of them. Um, yeah, uh, they're doing the same thing with the Hunger Games. Oh yeah, that's final nice uh, Yeah, I don't know if that's because they were wor- they they're not going to be. Uh, they've probably adapted the last two books. I don't know how well those have been adapted because I haven't read them. I'm waiting until all the movies are out, and then I'm going to read all the books. Um, but to me, that that uh, almost uh, screams to me that they're going to be doing the same thing. It's going to be there's not, not going to be much happening in the first half of that movie, and then it's all going to make, it'd be resolved in the second half. It's weird because the last Hunger Games book is notoriously terrible, and I've never read it. I've only read the first one. Um, but the the third book, everyone seems to agree that the third book is one of the worst finales to any series ever. So it's very strange that they chose that book with that reputation to be well. Different. Well, they they said that the second one, from what I've heard from reviews, where it's comparing comparison with the second book, the second book was like such a rehash, but they skipped over a lot of stuff in in that st- story so much because uh, the second one was actually much better. The movie was adapted better because they just didn't focus so much on just rehashing the last one. That's one interesting. Because I like the I second guess... Hunger Games movie, but I don't like the first one. 
Really? Sorry, Alex, what were you saying? Oh, I should say, I guess the uh, the Matrix sequels are kind of a good example of that, where it's they yeah. deliberately split it up into two movies when it only needed to be one, and both of those films are incredibly padded. Um, and it's yeah. just to get a trilogy, um, which is, again, just problematic from the fact that the first movie tells a complete story and you don't need to, you know, to tell <laughs> anything more. But um, this is going to sound kind of I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, as you say, the, the split there, I guess, makes sense, but there didn't need to be a split. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. Uh, um, this is going to sound weird and kind of shallow as far as titling goes, but I don't think you you are allowed to make a two part movie unless you have part in the title somewhere. Because that automatically um, differs your expectations. If you have a movie that's labeled mm-hmm. part one and it's only half a movie, that's not a problem in the way that if you only get a half a movie and it doesn't have that indication, it is a problem. That's true. Um, and that kind of brings us to something that I wanted to, to bring up with this was just serialized media in general. And that um, we've all read comics. Uh, we've all probably seen some old, old serials at one point or another. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's the whole convention of those is you get a short part of the story and then to be continued or the end question mark. Um, (laughs) and then it continues and then like every part has that. Um, so do you think those need to function differently than something for a larger story? Um, cause I guess TV shows do this too, depending on how serialized they are. Well, I, I prefer much more serialized uh, TV because um, you've got the you know that there's going to be a pretty much you know that at least you got the first twelve episodes or so to tell a story. So uh, why not use that? There's no need to tell like small independent stories. You can tell a long running arcing story, especially. That's what I'm liking a, a lot about uh, Arrow and from what I can tell so far with Flash. <laughs> uh, I'm going to mm-hmm. really, really enjoy the Flash a lot more now because it's going to be at least they're going to... From what I can tell, it looks like they're going in a completely different direction with that show. Um, well, because they finally figured out how to do it in Arrow Season 2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, the first season of that show is this weird misstep, but... That's a whole other discussion. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I like D, uh, DS9 serialized storytelling. That that's much better. I think that that's was like one of the first shows to well, not in modern times at least to fully take advantage of uh, the story of that I and in compare and comparison, I think. Flash is going to be uh, next generation to uh, Arrow's DS9, <laughs> from what I can tell. So you're going to have a much happier story on with Flash than you are going to have with like Arrow, which is probably going to be more like DS9, very dark and gloomy story. Mm-hmm. That's well, that's what. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess um, the other thing is really like, is that affected by, or is the effectiveness of cliffhangers affected by, uh, and we kind of brought this up with regards to seasons that end on a cliffhanger, but the amount of time between you seeing part one and part two, because binge watching is a huge thing right now, and you have entire, you have series where each season is released as a whole on Netflix now for people to binge watch. So does that affect things? Um, yeah, I would say so, um, because now we're able to judge things as entire pieces, uh, we get a lot of reviews online now, and a big part of that is reviewing episodes as they come out weekly, and they do Mm -hmm. that still for shows like House of Cards, even though we get the whole season, like every week they'd release a review, like on the AV Club, for an episode in that season, and I wonder if reviewing it like that hinders their experience and hinders their reviews, because those that show is clearly built to be binge watched. I don't know how you could watch that show any other way. Mm-hmm. And you have kind of a cliffhanger at the end of season one and kind of a cliffhanger at the end of season two, um, but not really, because they feel so complete anyway. They feel very much like someone had a twelve-hour script 
and they're just chopping it up into chapters for people to almost metaphorically read like it's a book. Mm-hmm. Mm. I I uh, I I like a, a much more complete piece. That's why, and that I that's why I'm not reviewing all of Doctor Who season eight till it's done, um, because I know that there, there's stuff in there that's going to be overarching. Um, so that's why I'm not reviewing it until it's done. I, like I'm doing reaction videos at the moment, but that's because um, I got a lot of views of the last one I did. So I'm like, why not? Do uh, do those for the entire season, um, but so at least people are getting my reaction from them. But I I think reviewing something like that episodic uh, episodically, you can do that, but do do it in a way that you like in your review. You're not re- sa- saying it. Look, this is. I know that this is going to be an ongoing story, so. Review each episode, then in the final one, review the entire season as a whole. It's because because that's the way it was designed to be done. So, but you, I don't like to uh, don't, don't like I don't hate to criticize reviewers for doing that 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 way because I'm not uh, I'm pretty good, but I I'm not the best reviewer. So. <laughs> Um, I know what you mean, though, and that was a big issue for me when I was doing Comic Vault on Geekvolution was, you know, you review comics monthly, or if it's a weekly book, I guess weekly, um, you get this small, small slice of a story, and it's like you don't really know, even know what to say about it because you don't know where it's going. And, yeah, again, you want to judge it as a whole. So that mm. was something that was just really difficult for me. Like, what do I even say about it? It's not finished. Yeah. And we kind of have that yep. right now um, because we're doing Batman Eternal. Yeah. And that book is really strange when it comes to talking about cliffhangers because there are some that are great. There are some that really make you wait in anticipation for what's next. There are some that are so bad that you're anticipating the next one just to see where the train wreck goes. Oh, I, I get that <laughs> joke. Um, and then there are some that you don't know what to think of because – the cliffhanger is designed in such a way that there's no possible way to care because you have no idea who that end reveal is supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. And that's, a, a, I think, a relevant thing to discuss with regards to cliffhangers is just the payoff, or I guess the where they leave off at the end of the first, um, first part of it. Uh, yeah, if you're left confused, then it's not particularly effective. And that is a big problem in that book where they almost consistently end it with a character reveal. And yeah. oftentimes it's been characters who um, we literally are seeing for the first time. It's a new character or a, a new version of a character. Mm. So you're like, what? Yeah, oh. it's not like, I, well, I, I guess I want to read the next part because I just want to know what the fuck is happening. It's not because I'm really excited for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a really weird thing, especially with that book. And I guess we don't want to review Batman Eternal while we're here, but... Um, as far as follow-ups go with that, there, every issue seems to have a cliffhanger, but you could place like a, a 60-30 bet and still maybe come out on top um, and assuming that the next issue will not deal with that cliffhanger. So if you're reading yeah. it all together as the, at the way it's meant to be, then it doesn't work because you have cliffhanger, 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 and your payoffs are few and far between. Definitely. Yeah, and I've recently decided to just read stuff in trade anyway because it's uh, it the best way better. to make I'm, it. I'm really trying to move back to that because I just I just found I enjoy that more and I mean obviously like financially it just makes more sense um, yeah because like, like, uh, I math like add up the individual issues then it, that costs more than just buying a trade so yeah. yeah also there's just I guess the filter factor of you know you can find out well ahead of time whether or not things are actually worth buying Rather than picking them up and saying like, I guess this was an okay issue. I'll wait it out till next time, and then no, it sucks too. And you're like ten bucks in the hole. <laughs> yeah, um, and with trades, it's weird because the cliffhanger effect seems to disappear when you're buying a trade. Um, like if you're reading it month to month, you get really big reveals at the end of an issue, and then by next issue you get a payoff. But if you're reading it in trade, 
at least for me, it feels like the breaks between issues start to fade away the more you get used to reading that format. And I find now a lot of comic book writers are right for trade anyway, because they know it's going to be collected. Um, I mean, back in the day, there wasn't a guarantee of that, um, unless right. it was like one of those old gigantic Marvel phone book things or something. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it is pretty much a guarantee now. So people are writing for that. And we're in this weird, and I guess it's that way with TV shows too, um, where we have collected media after the fact you have dvds or digital downloads or whatever you can mm-hmm. grab the whole thing so i and think that's why we've seen it they... move towards serialization and television over here they we might not have like um i, I, I quick flicks is nowhere near as good as netflix with this but they uh, are trying over here now whenever a show finishes like within a few hours of it finishing they have it up on online for you to watch in case you've missed it. That's and awesome. uh, and I think that that's a uh, that what that all should also be taken into account when it comes to ratings as well. Like, surely you can count how many hits every episode. The like episodes online have been hit after the fact as well. So oh, people are might not be watching this live, but they're watching it uh, anyway, uh, online. So maybe we should keep this around or, or something like that. Huh. Yeah, because that digital format's helped a couple of shows every now and then, um, where they're not big on TV, but because they're big online, it, it only makes sense to keep them going. Um, like, mm-hmm. Veronica Mars is coming back as a web series, and... Really? Most more of the uh, most of the reasons behind that are just that the movie got enough interest going on the internet um, to make people want to see more, and they decided to just do like almost YouTube video length episodes. Um, okay. and, the, and the pilot, or not the pilot, but the plot for that web series it doesn't sound that interesting because it's just one of the char- actors trying to get his character at a spinoff show. Okay. So it, it doesn't sound like the most fascinating thing, but it clearly shows that there's potential. That if you're online and you're t- certainly talking up a buzz, then maybe you have a chance to continue from there. Mm. Um, but it's weird because there's never a guarantee of that. So now more and more it seems like we're stepping away from cliffhangers and we're just trying to tell one story before we get canceled really quickly. Because um, yeah. the second out of shows that end in cliffhangers tend to get canceled. Um, speaking yeah. specifically of like Young Justice and Green Lantern, the animated series. Yeah, um, that's a sh- uh, that is a real shame. That uh, I hate it. I hate that when it happens. Like I hated it when I found out that Enterprise had gotten cancelled. And uh, like, granted, uh, when I was watching that, I wasn't thoroughly enjoying it as much as the others. But uh, I was like, start. Uh, I was very much of the opinion that after Voyager, they shouldn't have been Enterprise. They should have just focused on movies, and Enterprise should have happened a few years later. Um, Because they were just burnt out at that point. They'd done oh yeah, they definitely made series over the past like what ten, fifteen years, and they were just burnt out. Yeah, they needed a new creative team definitely. They needed the new blood in there. Um, Who was writing like the final season of that because they they definitely had some great ideas and unfortunately they they didn't get to write the final episode it was... yeah Manny Cotto was the showrunner for the final season and I mean that's the thing about Enterprise 2 that is sort of sad is you know it only got four seasons but all of the other from TNG to DS9 to Voyager all of those shows didn't start to get good until their third or fourth season. So, like, who knows how good Enterprise could have been by the end if it had gone seven seasons as well. Yeah, I I think season three of that show is pretty good. Season four is way better, except for the finale, which... Yeah, because they brought back Berman and Braga, who were the ones who made the show shitty in the beginning to write the yeah. finale. Yeah. Uh, but... Yeah, and there's... I guess uh, the other thing that is famous for cliffhangers, especially out here, um, one of the ones I'll, I'll bring up is 
just because it, it, it definitely set a shockwave through the, like, I wasn't watching it at the time, but I bet you I watched that, that final episode. I, that was, uh, Home and Away over here is very popular, and I understand it's very popular in Britain and various other places. Um, one of the main characters on that show, I, uh, they were building up this cliffhanger for the finale of the year before it came back like six or seven weeks later where the character that had been with the show for over 20 years so they had become such an institution she at the very end gets stabbed and she's on the ground and ends with a, mo a montage to a music video of all her big moments on the show uh, from when she was introduced to when she got to meet a famous singer out here by the name of John Farnham when she was sick <laughs> in bed, uh, various weddings she was at where she was just the bridesmaid and then there was where she got married and then, of course, her husband dies. All <laughs> 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 the, the very soap opera show. So, And the big question was, well, oh, they're killing her off, and then uh, then it was revealed on the next. Uh, it was very enormous whether or not she was going to come back, uh, which I thought was like the way to do it. Like you're, we're not, we're not telling you one way or another if they're coming back or not. But uh, she ended up coming back, and I think that was the time for her character to leave. I think they should have killed her off, and would have been much more impactful. But they wanted like few episodes after it came back I could I found out oh well she's staying alive and then she left like a year later anyway so <laughs> I'm like oh, would have been much more dramatic the other way around <laughs> but anyway that, I just thought I'd bring that one up I think so is there anything is else that Oh, sorry. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say, was there anything else that you guys had to say about cliffhangers? Um. Well, I just wanted to bring up, I guess, before we end this, because uh, it, it seems like cliffhangers um, is a smaller topic than I guess we originally thought it would be. Uh, yeah. It, it really seems like it really is just in the payoff and in the setup, and we've kind of hammered both those points out. But I wanted to ask um, both of you guys if. You've ever seen a cliffhanger that is really good, and the follow-up's really good as well, but it's not memorable. Because a lot of times, it seems like cliffhangers are there when they want to change status quo. Um, and there's been a couple of cases here and there where I've seen a cliffhanger um, with just between seasons, like um, Power Rangers and stuff. But the cliffhanger itself isn't, isn't as important as the episodes that follow it. Or the stories that follow it, or the events, really, whatever we're talking about. Um, so, has that ever happened to you guys? Nothing immediately comes to mind, but... I would bring up um, Time's Arrow, because those two episodes are just so forgettable. Yeah. Uh, I've never been a big fan of those. Um, yeah, um... There's those ones. There's a Family Guy, I guess, where Brian ends up leaving. Uh, like, they recently killed him off, but I'm talking about before that. Where they let... Uh, Brian ends up leaving the and going off to Hollywood and then ends up coming back in the next episode anyway. Um, but the good thing about it, the uh, thing I remember about that is there's this fi a funny montage at the beginning where... Uh, they show off a bunch of like cliffhanger stuff, <laughs> like uh, a boat explodes. With they're doing like it looks like Miami Vice. I don't know if that actually happened on Miami Vice, where there's a boat explodes. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a very Miami Vice thing. Yeah, uh, that one. Uh, just like where they don't do anything. Um, I think. Uh, oh. 
I think season the 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 bridge between the last two seasons of uh, Dawson's Creek was really lame. I think that ended up on a cliffhanger. I don't know, but it was like very lame. Like those last two seasons are very forgettable. So <laughs> I was gonna um, bring up um, things like Burn Notice and White Collar, where the cliffhangers are only there to advance the story just enough so that the concept can keep going. Because like the whole thing behind Burn Notice is that Michael Weston's a burn spy, and he's trying to figure out who did it to him. And all that happens in a cliffhanger is he gets a piece of the mystery, and then the entire next season is the the exact same setup of him going around helping people. And then there's a cliffhanger where he finds out another piece of information, and then just rinse and repeat. Uh, another one I would bring up, just because... Um, not that it was forgettable, but that that they killed off a really good villain on it, and I think he could have been really a good reoccurring villain throughout in NCIS, because it was like they tried to make it, he appeared a couple of times throughout the first and second seasons of NCIS, and he winds up killing Kate from the first two seasons of that show. Um. And the uh, the reason she was killed off because the actress was just in over her head with uh, what she had to do. Uh, so they kill her off, but then there's a two episode follow up, and it's clear that he's not not this double agent that he's supposed to be. Uh, and I thought that was really lame, and they kill him off in a really good way, but the they've all throughout it they've always tried to justify it why that they why it was good when it's not really that good because <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of like having someone to play for the two for the main character to have a, a nemesis that would would work throughout the work one off of one another throughout the like a Batman and Joker like uh, Murdoch and MacGyver sort of thing. Anyway. Yeah. So I guess we've all kind of like exhausted anything we had to say about this topic now. Oh yeah, like um yeah, is there um <laughs> anything else you guys want to say before I I don't think so. I mean I think we've sort of established you need a good setup and you need a good payoff and it needs to be interesting in both parts um, <laughs> yeah because like uh, yet to use the times arrow example like i'm not a big fan of those episodes they're not terrible they're just not terribly interesting and i think you know part two is an okay payoff to part one but it's just like it doesn't catch my interest at any point really what about descent the following season <laughs> <sighs> I'm not a fan of it, but then it's like, I think part one is definitely better. Um, mm -hmm. But that's only because there's a bit of mystery, and part one is less good if you know what part two is like. And what I was yeah. building up to was nothing, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, they, they, they had some awful ones to follow. Like, it's very hard to follow Best of Both Worlds for, like, cliffhanger or material but uh, yeah that, that's true I mean there's um, there's Redemption which is a big one obviously Chain of Command is one of those Ooh. ones where the first part is almost totally forgettable everybody remembers the second part which is the part the part where Picard's tortured um, there so are guess, four lights yeah exactly there are four lights um, so I guess that's an example of one where it's really the second part that people remember not the first Mm. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I think we pretty much hammered this out. Like uh, we mentioned, a couple of good ones and a couple of bad ones there. People uh, have their comments, so I think you know what their favorite cliffhangers are. Definitely. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, and any suggestions for later episodes? Please put them in there because uh, there someone suggested a commentary on. The I think it was the Incre Incredible Hulk 
Um, I haven't seen that yet, so I'm going to probably do that at some point. So, uh, in, and I I'm like that movie. To... I do. Yeah, uh, I think it's yeah. underrated. Yeah, that's what the the person said. So they wanted us to come at it, and uh, I'm not a big Hulk fan, but uh, yeah, so I'll probably get to that soon. Uh, probably before the year is out. Uh, that could be interesting so, to do because that that's a film I think that's a blueprint for what good movies are, and that that's both a point of criticism and of praise, and that could be fun to talk about. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure what we're going to be talking about next time, but uh, it wasn't even uh, I came up with this idea, and uh, I don't even think it was my turn. But we're probably going to discuss what we're going to do next time. Uh, after we uh, after I push stop here, so I'll let you guys know in some way what's coming up soon. Uh, and I hope everyone enjoyed my questions because uh, they they were really good. Uh, that was really fun to, for me to do. I'll probably do that every year from now on around my birthday. I'll film a bunch of stuff for for that to happen. Okay, uh, now I'm done plugging all my stuff. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for coming back. Um, so, uh, and thank you for listening out there, and we will be back uh, next month. See you all.